Okay, we're going to take a look at the game Frederick the Great. This was originally published by S&T Magazine in 1975. And below the box there, we have uh, the map as published in 1975. Now, Avalon Hill uh, re-released this game in 1982, fix fixing up the map, the counters, and uh, generally upgrading it, adding some scenarios. And that's the version of the game we're going to look at today. We'll look at the board, the pieces, give you an idea of what this game is all about. Okay, the game map for this one by Avalon Hill comes fully mounted, but I'm going to throw some plastic over it to keep it uh, flat, and we'll take a closer look. Okay, the graphics in 1972 were pretty uh, minimalistic by uh, game standards compared to today. There wasn't a lot of color in them, so Avalon Hill spiffied it up a bit. But the game is still very basic. You've got your mountain terrain here. And, uh, you know, with your hex sides, uh, blocking hex sides, your mountain passes, your major rivers, important towns, and the all-important fortress uh, hexes. Each of these represent fortresses, and the victory points are inside. Now, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Frederick's campaigns, but this is a bit of a complex period in European history. It's not easy to figure out. But basically, Brandenburg, Prussia, Frederick's Prussia is up here, and it's after the Silesian Wars. Frederick has taken Silesia from the uh, Austrians in 1745, and the scenarios in this game start pretty well in 1756, covering the Seven Years' War. Now, it's not a, um, a, a battle game. It's a grand, grand strategy. So you're moving armies around here, and the game is all about supply, logistics, and sieges. You'll get into battle for sure, but it's not about battle. It's really about maneuver, sieges, and uh, as a result, it's pretty um, representative of the period. Let's take a look at the counters and uh, the tables, and we'll see how this game plays out. Okay, the counters are fairly simple, and I didn't feel compelled to put them into trays uh, because their counters are so uh, generic. You get the Russians, of course, in green, Prussians in a kind of a dark blue, Hanoverians in a light blue. French is sort of a, a light, light gray, making them very similar to the Austrians, which are white. And you get the Sweden and Empire troops in black and a darker gray. Your generic counters are yellow to show depots and demoralization. We'll take a closer look at uh, the counters and the leaders. All right, here's a closer look at the uh, Prussian counters. You can see that they're very uh, simple. The strength points are just generic. You get twos, fours, ones, uh, eights. They're all just generic, so you can use them like change. That's their combat number on them. Not much to those. The leaders have four numbers on them. The uh, upper left represents their rank or uh, sonority. Um, one being, well, there's Frederick the Great himself. He's the first in seniority. And uh, the number on the right is the initiative. You want that number to be high. Higher is good. So Frederick is a 3. Ferdinand here is a 1. Lower left is their attack bonus. Frederick's a 3. And uh, his defense bonus is 2. So you can see uh, Zeiten and Kleist and all these other fellows. Keith, you can compare their values. Now, all of the other nationalities are the same way. Uh, I'll just show you a couple of Austrian units. But they represent the same thing. They're just uh, white and they have leaders, stuff like that. Uh, looking at this game too, I realize how far we've come in war games. These are not even double-sided counters. And um, the designer at the time recommended that you put on the back of the counters a letter to indicate what side they are because there are instances in the game when you flip the counters to the other side and you'll need to know what nationality they are. So uh, this game is uh, primitive by modern standards for sure, but it is one fine game, let me tell you. Um, I'll explain a little bit how movement and combat works and how sieges work, depots, and uh, give you a sense of uh, what the game is like. Now, um, Frederick the Great um, I've been reading a lot about him since getting the game and uh, trying to understand why he's great. Um, and he's not great for his military uh, ability. He's, he's good, but he's, he's not great. He certainly is no Napoleon. And if you study Frederick's battles, 
you'll be um, maybe surprised to know that he lost as many battles as he won. So why is he great? Well, you'd have to read a biography of Frederick to understand that. But you might say it's his political acumen, his, um, well, his ability to stand against great odds, what he did for Brandenburg, Prussia. He's quite the fellow, that's for sure. And it's appropriate that there's a game on his campaigns. Let's take a look how uh, combat and uh, sieges work. Okay, movement in this period is kind of interesting. You actually roll to see what your initiative or your movement points is going to be. So in this example, let's say we had a force under uh, General Henry here, and a force under Frederick, and a force under uh, Marshal Don here. And it's the Fred, uh, Depression's turn. You'd actually roll the dice once only for all your forces. So Frederick would roll the dice. In this case, he gets a two. You take the two and you add it to the leader's initiative and that's how many movement points he gets, up to a maximum of six. So in this case, Henry gets four movement points and Frederick would get five. So in this particular instance, Frederick and Henry's forces are too far to close in on Don should they wanted to engage with him. So in this case, an example, Frederick would have uh, five movement points. He'd go one, pay one for the river, two, three, four, five. To engage in this game, you actually have to enter the hex of the enemy. So, in this instance, Frederick is too far. Henry would go one, two, three, and stop, because he doesn't have enough movement points to cross the river. So, uh, that's the way movement works. It was interesting, and very, uh, I don't know, realistic for the period. Just, you never knew how far armies were going to move. Everything was about logistics and stuff, and supply. So, um... That's movement. Now, uh, another thing I might point out is the, um, how do you say, the hidden intelligence aspect of the game. Strictly in the game, you're never allowed to look underneath an enemy's stack. So, built-in hidden intelligence. The only time you are ever allowed to look under an enemy's stack is when you actually enter the hex and declare that you are engaging for combat. So, Frederick, hypothetically, if he got into a battle with Don's force here, he would not know the size of Don's force until it actually came to combat. And just for the sake of argument, let's say Frederick did engage with Don, and I'll uh, get into some options that occur before that too. So we find in this case that Frederick the Great is engaging with 10 strength points and Don has 9 strength points. What does that mean in terms of combat? Okay, no, I'm not great at math, so they use a percentage combat results table. And uh, I have a calculator with me, so uh, a lot of you can probably do this in your head. Good for you. I can't. Anyway, um, the, uh, the formula is you divide the defender's strength point, which is 9, into 100 times the attacker. So Frederick's got 10, so 10 times 100 is 1,000. You divide it by 9, divide by 9, and you get 111%. So, uh, you'd, the table that Frederick would use would be this 100 through 149%. And you'd roll in here to see the losses and what happens. Now, I might point out that the combat results table on purpose is very, um, you might say, indecisive, unless you get great odds. So half the time, you're each going to lose a strength point. One of you may be demoralized. And uh, it's very indecisive. And that's because battles in this period were kind of indecisive. Soldiers were very expensive to train and maintain, and both sides were very reluctant to commit and uh, to have their armies destroyed. This is not Napoleonic combat by any means. But let's roll the dice and see what would happen in this hypothetical battle of uh, Frederick uh, attacking General Don. Okay, he rolls a two. And on the table, that is... It says 15, and on the right it's 10L. Now, the attacker, that's 15%. Again, you have to pull the calculator out unless you can do it in your head again. So what will that mean? Okay, uh, well, that works out to 15% losses, which is 1.5 uh, strength points for Frederick. 
I couldn't find in the rules whether you round down or up for losses. For the percentage, you round down, but it doesn't say for the losses. Um, hmm. Anyway, I'll round down for now. So you would uh, remove this 2 with a 1, and that would be Frederick's losses. Now, the um, Austrians got, uh, what, that um, 10L result. And the L means what? Ah, uh, yes, the L means that the lowest-ranked leader is lost, which in this case would be General Don. Now, according to the uh, percentage loss, they would lose 0.9 factors. So I suspect that you round up. I'll have to check that in the rules. Anyway, that's the way combat works. So in this case, Don would either lose one or nothing. I'm not sure. And uh, the defender, um, does he have to retreat? Uh, yeah, he does. And you actually roll a die to see if um, you retreat. You roll a die. And in this case, it's two. And uh, the retreating force has to remove uh, retreat two boom points. So we'll have Austrians retreat there. And Frederick has won his little battle. And I think you mark the, the defender with a demoralized marker after your retreat. Let me just check that. Yes, you do mark the retreating force as demoralized. So that's how combat uh, works. Now, things are a bit more complicated than I'm showing. You have to, there's all kinds of rules for retreating towards fortresses and in supply. Uh, supply and fortresses are everything in this game. So um, this is perhaps not a great example of combat. Well, maybe it is. Uh, it wasn't much of a battle, was it? Each of them lost a step and um, the Austrians retreated one, one space. So winning the game is really about capturing these fortresses, which is five points here, five points there, ten points for others. So uh, it's really a, a game of maneuver and siege. Let's see how a siege works. Okay, in this situation we have a uh, Austrian force at Konigratz, and if you want to indicate that a force is inside a fortress, you flip them, which is why you need those uh, designations for your country on the back, A for Austria in this case. So here in this example I've got some Austrians here at Konigratz and they're upside down indicating that they're inside the fortress. Well let's say Frederick wants to attack this. He'd roll his dice again, see how many movement points he gets. He has in this case six movement points which is enough, which is enough to get into the Konigratz uh, space. So what he does is this. Got a bad shadow here. He goes one, two, three, and lands on the space. And now he's in a siege situation. But he's not actually besieging the place yet. That's quite a big deal. Because it takes time to prosecute a siege. What you'd have to do is you have to create a depot in this space. And there's all kinds of rules for creating depots. Depots are created by a force of ten strengths or more. In this case, Frederick's got ten. So that means next turn he'd have to start a depot, he'd take a depot counter, upside down, put it on his space. Then next turn the depot becomes active, flip it to its other side, and now Konigratz is under siege. The garrison can't really get out without fighting, and you'd be rolling on an appropriate surrender table, siege res resolution table, each turn to see if the a breach has been made or there's no effect. So sieges can consume a lot of time. Of course, if you take Konigratz, you're going to have nice five victory points. So the game is about siege rather than combat. As you can see, the board has got lots of uh, towns that have fortresses in them. Now supply is really interesting too. I really like the way supply uh, works in this game. You virtually have to have a chain of depots to move into enemy territory. So let's say for the sake of argument, um, Prussia has this kind of a chain of troops. Something like that. Okay, in this example we've got a chain of uh, fortresses occupied by Frederick. Torgau here, Dresden, and Prague are all occupied by uh, Frederick. And fortresses act as supply depots. But if in the absence of a fortress, you'll need to create a depot. And to be in supply, you have to be within five hexes of another uh, depot. 
So in this case, Frederick is here near Prague. But if he moved away from Prague, further than five hexes, he'd be out of supply. And you don't want to be out of supply in this game. So here, in this case, Frederick would want to stop perhaps at that hex, take the time to construct a depot, which remember takes a while, one turn to start the depot, another turn to finish it, and then he could leave a garrison at the depot and move on. So that's the way supply works. And the Austrians and the uh, other countries work in a similar manner, except the Prussians can be five hexes away from their depots. The uh, Allied forces can only be four. So that's the essence of uh, supply. Uh, I won't say much more about the game, um, except that there's a lot of scenarios in it. The scenarios start in 1756, and they go to, I think, 1763. Um, 1762, actually. So, depending on the scenario, you're going to have a lot of life in this game. The 1756 scenario bears no resemblance to, let's say, the 1758 or 1759 scenario. They are quite different. Uh, different forces, different setups, different political affiliations. So, there's a lot of life in this game. Um, not much more to say about Frederick the Great. Uh, really, it's uh, there's only eight pages of rules. They're in the uh, kind of the old SPI style because it's a direct reprint. Uh, they can be a little wordy at times, but we're, we are talking only eight pages. And like I said, lots of scenarios. And in the general magazine, they did do some variants, and it's my understanding that they included them here in the game. I'm not sure. I, I'm not that familiar with it. Um, Frederick the Great, yeah, uh, a good game. And uh, on a topic that just isn't done much, I was looking around for Frederick the Great games, and uh, boy, there's precious few out there. We do have the Battle Series by Clash of Arms. That's very tactical. But Grand Strategy, we have very few games out there. And though this game came out in 1982, I still think it's um, quite a good game. And uh, I'm going to be exploring it in the next uh, weeks or so, playing with a friend. And... Um, Anyway, that's it for Frederick the Gate, the Campaigns of the Soldier King. Thank you for watching.